Okay. Uh, yeah. So welcome, <clears throat> welcome back to the special ask. Excuse me. Welcome back to the special access podcast. Thank you for joining us once again. In this episode, we're going to be looking at the potential for congressional hearings of the UAP topic. So before we start, let's introduce our panel. Welcome back, Bob McGuire and Ross Coulthard, who we've recently had on the show. And welcome back, Stephen Bassett, another returning champ, who was my first guest besides the late John McAfee nearly two years ago. So we won't redo any lengthy bios for you guys due to time constraints. So just a brief outline of why we've invited you today. Um, Stephen Bassett is an exopolitical activist and is the executive director of the Paradigm Research Group, who brought about the Citizens Hearing on Disclosure in 2013, which was a pivotal point in my own understanding of the phenomena, I just want to add. Uh, we'll provide a link to those film proceedings, and I highly recommend every single minute of it. It will give the people an idea of how things might pan out if hearing, congressional hearings are called. So uh, Dr. Bob McGuire, Bob worked as a scientist on government black projects and knows some of the dark secrets of the US government and private contractors. Ross Coulthard is an award-winning investigative journalist who for the last few years has done a deep delve into the UAP topic and has had personal access to Christopher Mellon and Lou Elizondo. So this is a special episode for us as we have three great guests in four different time zones. So let's get to it. I'm going to kick, to kick things off. I'm going to hand it over to you, John. Okay, mate. Thanks for that. So welcome, guys. And uh, it's good to have you all back. Uh, and this is obviously an important time um, we're hoping for a congressional hearings, and we're, we're going to be discussing that today. Um, so we've, we've just had the DNI June report. It was downplayed for months before the release by Christopher Mellon and Lou Elizondo because they knew barriers were being created by the CIA and the Air Force and the lack of access due to the project lead investigator being replaced in the UAPTX uh, and that replacement not having the clearances that they needed. Um, the report has not really gone down well in the UFO community um, because it was so light on revelations and was so historically restrictive. But although it was not big on revelations, did it open the Pandora's box? Will this re weak report actually lead to more disclosures? Um, will it lead to the holy grail of UFOlogy? Congressional hearings. It's the one thing we're all after. Um, so could each of you give your views on that? If you could start us off on that, Stephen, that'd be great. Okay. Um, I want to start this way. Uh, last night I had the privilege of uh, watching for the second time, and the first time I didn't really pay close enough attention, the movie's called Lincoln. And it's uh, directed by Steven Spielberg. Of course, it stars Daniel Day-Lewis, a very, one of the greatest actors of our time. So I watched this movie this time carefully. And what was going on in this particular movie was the, the days lead, and weeks leading up to the passage of the amendment, provide, ending slavery, the Emancipation Proclamation and so forth. Uh, and a lot of people think, well, back a ways, then Lincoln decided to free all of the slaves, sign something, and it was done. No, it's not, not that easy. It showed how extraordinarily complicated this process was going on, how difficult it was, because not only were they trying to do something historically significant, but they were doing it while the Civil War was underway, going toward, it was toward the end of the Civil War, and it gets into it deeply, and it portrays in a, in a way what's happening now that I hope people will try to come to understand. What would I say we? Certainly what many people engaged in this issue are wanting and expecting is the end to the truth embargo, a term I came up with some time ago to replace the term UFO cover-up, truth embargo which is the formal, conf uh, the, the, the formal policy of the United States to keep the truth about the ET reality, the fundamental truth, away from the, from the public and contain it. The end of the truth embargo will be one of the most profound events in human history, and we're trying to wrap it up, and we're getting there. But we're trying to do that in the middle of extraordinary history, which makes it far, far more difficult. And what, what history am I talking about? Well, aside from the fact that we're in the second Cold War, 
and that the potential for nuclear uh, annihilation is as great as it's ever been. We're in the middle of extraordinary political times in the United States. We're in the middle of a hundred year pandemic. Uh, there are major bills coming out. It is incredibly complicated what is happening. That doesn't mean that we're not going to get there, but it, it affects the timing and it affects the decisions being made. And so I'd like to open with that to let people know that what we're going to be discussing today is not trivial and the context is not trivial. And the goal is not trivial. This is huge history that big movies will be written about in the future. That's what I'd like to say right now. Thank you. Okay, Ross, can you go next, please? Sure. Did it open Pandora's box I guess for us? I, I, uh, one thing I love about you, Steve, is you're an optimist. <laughs> I, uh, I, I had the pleasure of interviewing Steve a few months ago, and uh, uh, he's very much with his finger on the pulse there in Washington. And I, I guess I, I defer to his political shrewdness because, Steve, you do know a lot about Washington that I don't know. But what, one thing I do know is, uh, as a journalist, I've, I've done numbers with politicians. And one of the things I did for my research was talk to congressional staffers, senatorial staffers, and try and get a finger on the pulse of whether there really is the political will to make congressional hearings happen. And I, I have to be honest and say I'm not persuaded that there is. And I, 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 I hope I'm wrong, but I, I get the impression that, that what's happening at the moment is a period of history that is essentially history repeating itself, that we're back where Say, for example, Roscoe Hillencotter, the former director of the CIA, was in the, uh, in the late 1950s, trying desperately through his own UFO organization that he'd set up with eminent, reputable military officials, uh, trying to break, as Steve calls it, the truth embargo. And it never happened. And it never happened because the, the powerful people in the US government didn't want it to happen. And I, I, I do think there is a possibility that history may be repeating itself, that we may be seeing a moment where um, wh wh what has happened is the US uh, Pentagon has basically given enough of what it wants to say for the moment. It has posed the quite unprecedented admission. You know, it's, it's made the unprecedented admission that there is a reality here that that it's essentially been being evasive about for the past 70 years, certainly for the past 50. Um, but I'm not 100% sure. I, I had a conversation two days ago with a, uh, a congressional staffer who I befriended from a, a very prominent um, uh, member of the, uh, the Senate. And they, uh, they told me that they didn't think that there was the numbers and that uh, ultimately what what is necessary is for more revelations to be made in order to develop a momentum. So I guess my position very strongly at the moment is I think there's a good chance that this may all just fade away. And that's certainly the hope of um, the gatekeepers to the truth embargo, as you call it, Steve. I've got no doubt at all that there is incredible secrets that the United States government is sitting on or certain officials in the US government, but I'm not entirely persuaded they're prepared to uh, reveal them right now. Can you go ahead then, Bob? Do you yeah, think sure. The Pandora's box has been opened? Uh, well, I think that the rock is at the tar top of the snowy, snow-covered mountain. And it's gone down a few feet, and it's gathered some snow and momentum. But I'm a little worried that it might hit a flat spot. So I'm between Steve and Ross. So I'm going to give you the pluses and give you the minuses. So the pluses uh, was this lousy assessment, which was six pages of saying nothing, essentially. But was for the first time, officially and in the congressional record, saying there is a phenomenon and it is real. The most important thing that happened on December on the, on the 25th was uh, Deputy Secretary of Defense Catherine Hicks uh, put out a directive to all of DOD and all of its agencies 
et cetera, that they would cooperate with uh, informing Congress, the, def the, the uh, uh, defense appropriation and armed services and um, uh, the intelligence committees about what they, what they could learn and that internally to the Pentagon, the truth embargo was going to be over in the sense that she assigned the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence, uh, who, who now holds the same position that Christopher Mellon had when he was inside the Defense Department, uh, to coordinate all these activities and that they would have the necessary accesses and so forth to move forward. And the second most important thing that happened in those couple of days immediately after was that the Director of National Intelligence, Avril Haines, told Congress that she would be updating them with a lot more information uh, 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 in, within 90 days. So July, August, September. So, so supposedly in September or, or, or earlier or later, depending on how things go, uh, there will be an update that will apparently have considerably more information, but it's almost surely going to be classified. To go further, they have to get details, and the details will be written documents, uh, maybe only the executive summary, uh, which is you know under 100 pages of the, re the classified report will go forward, and maybe they will see some evidence. Now, the National Security Council at the White House, they've seen it all. I mean, the people forget that all these entities operated in the executive branch, and the president is the leader of the executive branch, and all the national security state is managed politically and uh, 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 from exec by the executive uh, branch it, by the National Security Council. Now, the National Security Council has lots of different entities' representations on it. So all three-letter agencies, DOD, State Department, et cetera, all have people that sit inside the White House to inform and gather what policy is and disseminate it to the agencies. So the National Security Council got a massive briefing, much more detailed than almost anyone else got. And so, so what does this leave us? We have the potential for more stuff coming out. Do I believe there will be hearings? Absolutely not. I do not believe there will be hearings. Why do I believe there will not be hearings? Because whoever is the uh, head of the committee in which the hearings will be held can't control all the members. And, there, and the, the, the people that come before those committees are under uh, federal statute to tell the truth. If they lie to the committee, they can be charged with perjury or lying to Congress. And uh, so if, if they have these hearings and witnesses are sworn in, a, 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 a member who is really stirred up and ready to go can say, you're going to tell us all right now about Roswell. I mean, or just anything. They cannot control it. So there are members calling for hearings. I just don't believe the, the head of the committees will allow these hearings to go forward. And these committees are little fiefdoms. Now, they can be overruled by the committee, but they rarely are. They're rarely overruled by committees, by the committee members. The chairs of the committees will control the agenda for the committees, and typically the, the chair and the ranking member get together and decide stuff. And, but, what, but as Steve pointed out, we're in a really, really tough political time. Just let me give you an example. The United States has let its infrastructure crumble for 20 years, and we continue to say we're going to do stuff, and right now, we're sweating bullets trying to figure out if we can get 60 people to say we're going to rebuild the roads and bridges. And I mean, it's just it's pathetic. The single greatest infrastructure laden country in the 1960s is now letting its entire infrastructure crumble because we can't get politics out of the way. So in, in, that, in that context, it's hard to see what would be Biden's uh, purpose so what purpose it would serve Biden and his agenda, along with that Democrats in Congress and the, and the Senate and the House, to have these big hearings and stir all sorts of things up. So I think there's some hope, but I'm going to tell you where most of the hope lies with me. I, I see that Jeremy Corbell has slowed down 
And the last video he let out, he, the Pentagon would not back it up. And so uh, I hope that, that I'm wrong in saying that that's been cut off well, because he stirred up a lot of stuff with those videos he put out. And he got the Pentagon to say that a bunch of them are real. So if we have those kinds of things coming forward, I want to go along with Ross. If we get a lot of these kind of revelations that stir things up and get a lot of mainstream media, print media, people calling their Congress critters and saying, go forward, there's hope. But the need for infrastructure and all the voting rights and the deep near civil war level hatred inside the United States between one group of states and another uh, it's really hard to see how some major new agenda will be introduced into the politics of the country, uh, though there is a lot of interest. I'm, I'm hopeful, but not. I don't realistically think we'll have these hearings. Where I agree with Steve and, and Ross, we, I think all three of us believe that if we got hearings, the Pandora's box is wide open. It'll blow open, but I just don't believe we're going to get hearings. Hmm. And we've had uh, we've seen one congressman called for hearings, but apart from that, it's been relatively silent. And why aren't we seeing calls from people who have seen the report annex? Uh, what's going on? And is anybody concerned? And does anybody have any idea what might be contained in the classified annex? Steve, if you want to go first. Uh, well, those are those are good questions, but I, I'm afraid I need to respond to the uh, previous gentleman. Uh, sorry, and sorry. I believe me, I have I, I, I'm known for having respect for everybody in the field and uh, and under and, and, and accepting and understanding there's so many perspectives on this. But I'm afraid I have must disagree on multiple levels here. Um, to some degree, one of the things that we've seen of late is a much broader glimpse into the process, into what is happening. Whereas in the past, it was all pretty much obscure. In other words, we've been led into the sausage factory and we're getting to watch the sausage being made. And a lot of people are going, oh my God, you really, now, ah, that, ooh, why this? Oh, why that? I get it, okay. So I, 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 I respect that, but I think I can boil it down a little tighter. Let me see, very quickly. The, the 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 New York Times articles was a milestone, nothing like it had ever happened before, and it, as far as I'm concerned, pretty much marked the 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 Rubicon. In other words, once that was crossed, there was no going back. There would never be another 1969 and closing of Blue Book, Condon reports, things like that. We were now on our way to disclosure. The question is, how comfortable would it be? How long would it take? So that was an absolute milestone. And to put that in perspective, of all the things that happened because of that event and those story that was provided to them by the TTSA people, probably the most significant was the gun camera footage. If, if we were talking 30 years ago, right, somebody would have come forward with something like that the New York Times would have put a couple of photos on the front page taken from the footage and say, here's the story and here's something like uh, that we're, that's in the clip and blah, blah, blah. Uh, and then the people would have bought the paper, thrown it away and, or put it at the bottom of a birdcage. That would have been that. And if you wanted to see the footage, you'd have to apply to the network and try to get access to the archive. Uh-uh, not, not in 2017. The New York Times and all other papers will soon be living on the net. There won't be any paper. They put the gun camera footage up on their website. Over the last three years, those clips, particularly the Tic Tac clip, have been seen probably one or two billion times worldwide. One or two billion times. And so we went from having never had a single gun camera clip of a UAP intercept ever being formally released to the public to one being released to the New York Times and now being seen by 2 billion people or 2 billion views. That's one way to encapsulate that milestone, but there's more to it than that. Anyway, so there's that, okay? Since then, what you have seen is 
politicians, agencies, uh, military services, and a whole lot of other people, former members of government, former CI directors, trying to adjust to and respond to the inevitable. In other words, a lot of people recognize that when those articles hit, the truth embargo was done. It was just a question of when you could stick a fork into it. Now, so that is one thing. But the historical context of when it happened was another. And the historical context was the United States was in a pretty much unprecedented political time. What was going on in our politics? What was going on in our White House? We've never seen in our lifetime. So that was non-trivial. Non-trivial, believe me. I, uh, the, the, his, history will be writing thousands of books about what took place from the election of November 2016 until the inauguration of 2021. And I can tell you, we have only begun to understand what the hell happened there. So we had that, all right? And so the process triggered by those articles was subject to all of the political developments that happened after that, and it slowed it down. It slowed it way down. As I've said many times, the plan was not what happened. The plan was those articles were supposed to hit in late 2016 or January of 2017. And in, in the Clinton presidency, you were going to see rapid developments. The New York Times articles would have triggered that into all that had happened during her campaign and all the coverage. Disclosure would already be done. We'd be four years into the disclosure process. That's not what happened. And so it slowed it down. And then as we approached what would be a significant change in the political circumstances, a stabilization that would allow them to move forward, a hundred year pandemic slammed into the human race. It's not done. We handled it badly, very badly, awfully, globally, a disaster. I can only say that if, if, if the American response to this pandemic had been the kind of response, uh, similar to the response we would have made to Pearl Harbor, we'd still be, we all be speaking Japanese right now. So it was a disaster. And so that was now the, uh, another context. And so as we move forward, the, 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 the disclosure event that we're seeking is subject to, as, as Bob appropriately uh, stated, the pandemic status and the political status. And I've been trying to measure that all along. Now, the pandemic status has taken a turn for the worse, sadly. It's going to get very bad. I'm following it very closely. Hundreds of thousands of more Americans are going to die. Globally, millions of more people are going to die. Almost all of it is unnecessary. And those that help make it unnecessary will be accountable to history, if not to the present. So that has slowed things down. And so I am now saying that hearings or call for hearings is not going to happen anytime soon, weeks away, maybe months away. It depends upon how the variant situation goes and the vaccination situation goes. We're starting to see those opposed to being vaccinated starting to get the light. And, and, but it's going to take time because it's very, very late in the game. And so there's that. Politically, I'm not worried about... I, again, politically, there are two fundamental things that are, are at issue in Washington right now. Three things. One, the infrastructure bill, which is a major bill, the uh, voting rights bill, which is an even more important bill, and then the issue of the filibuster. With those things in play, no, no, nobody is going to call for hearings. I mean, actually, in a significant way, beyond what Andre Carson did, it's going to call for hearings. So that's going to delay it. Now, those bills are going to be passed pretty soon. I believe the filibuster issue is going to be, they're going to make a move on that pretty soon. And so that's the political context. And now we've got the pandemic context. All right. But let me make it clear. And I, I won't go further than this. There is much more that I can talk about, and maybe I will in this show, that is relevant to the subject. And what, the con what, what that represents is that I am absolutely convinced the Department of Defense has thrown in the towel they have basically said, you won, and we're going to get disclosure, and we're going to be part of it, but we're going to do it in a way that is good for us. 
Secondly, I believe that there are plenty of people on the Hill ready to have those hearings. A few have spoken up. You may see more. One of the reasons the hearing process is not only the way to go, but the easiest path to go, and not, not all Americans understand this, is that every sing single committee chair can call a hearing any time they want. The president is not the person that does that. It is not a vote. They don't take a vote on the committee and say, shall we have hearings? If Marco, Ru I say, if Mark Warner wants a hearing, there will be one. And if he wants that hearing a week from today, it will happen. That is the nature of the hearing process. And that makes it pretty simple. All you need is one of seven key committee chairs to simply say, we have hearings next week and you get them. The leader can't stop it. The Senate majority leader can't stop it. The president can't stop it. And so that makes it pretty easy to get a hearing, assuming one wants to do that. And so that's very good. So am I optimistic still? Absolutely. Do I see delay? Absolutely. But we will have hearings this year. I think we'll still have them later in the summer unless a variant turns up that is absolutely brutal. And I have to tell you, and it saddens me to have to say this. I mean, this is outrageous. But there is a variant in Peru. It is called Lambda. It hasn't hit here yet. But Peru has the highest death rate in the world because it only has 2% vaccination. And the reason it only has 2% vaccination is the wealthy countries dabbled and diddled and screwed around and delayed it so that we're catching up with our own vaccinations when we should be shipping out hundreds of millions of vaccines to the world. And so Peru is going to be slaughtered. And if that lambda gets here and it's as bad as we think, well, folks, all I can say is hearings may be delayed. I'm sorry about that. I, I, it, 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 it angers me that this historical event so profound to our history is being held up because of the slaughter of millions of people around the world because of the stupidity and arrogance of politicians in the countries that have all the wealth. History will not forgive them. I will not forgive them. They need to pay a price for this. These are, these are the kinds of mistakes that simply cannot be tolerated. And so that's the sausage factory. That's what's going on. Thank God this issue is even bigger than that. It transcends politics and religion. It transcends stupidity and arrogance. And because it does, it will happen. And I still think it will happen this year. Great. Uh, Ross or Bob, do you have any, or John, do you have any uh, reply to that? I, I guess one thing I'd like to, to add is where I am optimistic is that Steve's right that prior to the 2016 election, and, and this is the thing that I find the most profound realization for me as a, a cynical, hard <laughs> bitten journo, is that there really was, there was a group of generals, group of military officials, intelligence officials who were genuinely seriously engaging with a presidential candidate to discuss disclosure. And, and that's borne out by the WikiLeaks leaked emails from the right. DNC. And I, 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 I don't think, the thing I find gobsmacking is my colleagues in mainstream media in the United States have utterly missed the significance of those leaked emails. Because as a journo, you, you look, as a journalist, you look for source material that is unimpeachable. You, you look for ways of investigating a subject that, that take you to a level of knowledge where you can be reasonably sure about something. And I'm very sure, and I find it just shocking in my own head to say this, I'm very, very sure that in that period, 2015, 2016, a punk rocker called Tom DeLong really was engaging with a bunch of very senior officials in our military and intelligence defense infrastructure and talking about disclosing something. And we don't quite know from those emails what that was, but we do know that it related to the, you know, the likelihood of an extraterrestrial relationship with planet Earth. And I, I, I don't, for the life of me, understand why in the course of their um, <clears throat> investigations, the 
New York Times haven't actually addressed that issue and actually why at press conferences in the, uh, in the White House briefing room, why the White House uh, spokesperson hasn't been questioned rigorously about this. Because those emails show there were and are people at a very high level, uh, especially in the DNC, who, who were talking about disclosure. One thing we haven't discussed yet is the is the implications of the midterms, because I, I, I think that we've only got a very narrow window. I agree with Steve to some extent that it's going to take a lot longer than people expect and that there are still people inside the uh, the DNC who are seriously interested in pushing slowly for the Congress to have hearings. But I worry that we've only got a very narrow window. And one thing I am aware of is that there is a very strong opposition from people, particularly in your US Air Force. Your, your Air Force are dogmatically opposed to any kind of public disclosure of what's going on. And they've not participated at all so far. It's pretty amazing. So I want to point, point let me support you and point out one thing, a couple of things. Um, all, all, the, the, the third week of August is the end for any effective measure on voting rights. Why is that? That's the date the census is published and every Republican state will rush like mad to gerrymander before anything else can be done. So there's no hope, in my opinion, for major voting rights improvements in the short term that will impact the midterms if that voting rights is not passed by the third week of August. Okay, that's number one. And number two, I am hopeful like Steve is, and you are, and all of us are really, that this administration will not impede people throughout the government testifying to Congress. But because I just don't think we have the kind of leadership we had between 2017 and 2021. But I want to remind people that single orders from an executive had every member of the executive branch going to hearings and giving them nothing. They turned over no records. They obfuscated. They, they asserted executive privilege where none existed. And so it is possible. Yes, these, these chairmen... These chairmen can call hearings whenever they want to and get absolutely nothing if the executive branch tells its people that works for it, this is all executive privilege and or you cannot talk or you're to whatever. I don't think that will happen in the Biden administration. I hope it won't. And and the reason, the, 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 the evidence I have that it won't happen is high-level briefings were done on the National Security Council, and Biden is privy to every bit of that, and he's done not a single thing that I can detect to impede any of this coming out. So I am hopeful that if these people come before Congress, they will be allowed to testify nearly truthfully and wholly, and we'll just have to see. So I'm hopeful. I want to be as optimistic as Steve, but I've also got to tell you, it is possible for this to be stopped. Okay, I can provide perspective here. Let's take another look at what happened uh, from, from my perspective. Uh, first of all, the Marco Rubio is the one that initiated an action which had significant consequences. And that was the call for a report. He did this while he was the chairman of the Senate Intel Committee. He is a Republican, and he's not known to be a middle-of-the-road Republican, um, but he's a powerful guy. He was briefed, along with Mark Warner and the Intel Committee, by Christopher Mellon, who briefed a lot of other people. And so he deliberately put that language in there in order to advance the issue and his own political uh, ambition, which is fine. He put a 180-day deadline on it, which was smart. But the Department of Defense uh, and all the other agencies knew that there was going to be a report required in July of 2020 because that language was revealed at that time. They knew what, was, what the language was, 
but the deadline or the 180 day clock didn't start until the bill was signed in December. So that put the deadline June 25, somewhat arbitrary. So the Department of Defense had one year to decide how are we going to respond to this? And I can assure you, they put a lot of effort into exactly how they would handle it. All right, this wasn't, this is not being made up as they go. So they knew they had to come up with a report. Now, the fact that that Rubio was the one that put that in the language immediately makes this a nonpartisan process. Now, Mark Warner is in charge of the committee now, but most people know that the Senate Intel Committee runs more like a partnership in which the ranking and chair operate pretty much on equal level. Mar uh, John, uh, Warner has never said anything that was uh, opposed to this process, and I believe that he's quite comfortable with it. But he's not said anything lately. Okay, oh, so I'm, I'm sorry. I want to. I want to. I want to correct you there. He did say something in the last month, which was said, and and the the quote is essentially, "We didn't get a lot in this report, and we're looking for a lot more." He did say that within the last thirty days. Uh, yeah, he was asked. Uh, he was asked about the report. Yes, he was asked. And about he was negative on the report and hoping for more. That's yeah, really yeah. a good thing. That's a great thing. It is. It is. But again, the, the, the language that we got back from Mellon and from Warner, which was not much, and a lot of people are unsatisfied with that, again, comes down to, boy, how do I say this? People who are not following this as closely as I am, who haven't archived and read the nearly 1,000 articles that have been published on the TTSA and all of the actions related to it, and all of this stuff related to the report. Over 1,000 articles, all right? I've read them all. They're looking at this and going, well, what does this mean and what that mean? And what they're missing is their strategy, all right? People are having to say this or that and act this way or that way in service to the strategy, all right? And what is the strategy? The strategy is to get the hearings. And so if it, it, they're not gonna say things that can create a problem for getting that goal. So without understanding the strategy, a lot of people just jump on what is said. It's, oh, well, that's not enough, or this should have been that. No, 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 no. They got to think that way. So what, what happened was actually pretty, pretty good. And again, you need context. Rubio, for whatever reason, said, we want a classified and an unclassified accounting. He didn't ask for the hard stuff. He didn't ask for the Roswell records to be delivered to the Senate. Uh, he, he's basically saying, we want you to analyze how you're dealing with this, what are the setups and so forth, and come back to us. Now, is that because he really wanted to know that? No. It was because he wanted to get the DOD to be participating in this and, and come back with it in, 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 in information. And, of course, he wanted to get the benefits of doing it, and he got tremendous benefits. Lots of coverage, many positive articles. It was a brilliant political move. And so the DOD had this problem. How are we going to handle this request? Let's talk about the unclassified part, meaning the part that was going to go to the public. Let me be very clear about this. The Department of Defense does not want to provide to the public anything of substance about this issue, period. Now, you may say, why is that? Because they're evil and they want to keep all their secrets? Not exactly. It is not the prerogative of the Department of Defense to inform the public about the extraterrestrial presence, period. It's not their job. It's not what they're supposed to do. They work for the President of the United States. The President of the United States is the only person who has the power to unclassify anything that he or she wants. And so this idea that the Department of Defense is going to put out some really cool information that's going to like, whoa, okay, uh, uh, change the attitude. No, they don't want to do that. It's not their job. They want to give it to the Congress and let the Congress decide what to do about it. That's the way it's supposed to be, and they know that. Unfortunately, not unfortunately, but Rubio said we want an, un we want an unclassified report too. And so here is what they chose to do. Brilliant strategy. All of this is strategy, folks. Take it in context, not just on one event. One, 
they deliberately leaked some information about the public report to the New York Times on June the 3rd. The New York Times wrote that up right away because they obviously trusted the source. That almost came directly from the Pentagon. Might have been the ONI. And what was the leak? The public report is going to say that we've examined these, uh, these particular cases. We find no evidence of an extraterrestrial aspect, but we can confirm that the technology represented in these accounts, like the Tic Tac, is not something that we have. It's not something in the United States military arsenal. Full stop. Now, a lot of people go, oh, that's interesting. That's interesting. Most people uh, that, in public that read that didn't get it. They didn't realize what they just said. What they said in that leak without actually saying it was total George, George Suclocus. What they said in that leak is, we're not saying it's extraterrestrial, because they can't, but it's extraterrestrial. Yeah. <laughs> so they leaked that. Now, 13 days later is when they delivered the classified report. Now, there's controversy about that right now. We've heard 73 pages, 400 pages. Recently, John Green, Greenwald felt he's, uh, uh, believes he's confirmed 17 pages. I don't know how many pages it was, but it was some pages. Also, they got a briefing. All the committees got a briefing and, and, and saw video. So that was the classified. Now, guess what? Because of the public report due the 25th, all the media coverage was focused on that. Very little coverage about the classified report. That's exactly what the DOD wanted. Right? They wanted the, the, the committees to have time to review this material and decide what they're going to do about it without a bunch of reporters running around in the hallways trying to get their point of view. The reporters were covering article after article about the coming public report. So, 16th, 13 days later, the, re the public report drops. Guess what? There's not much in it. It's six pages of acronyms and, and, and DOD speak and the two things that they had already leaked to the public, which emphasized again, we don't see extraterrestrial evidence, but we don't have that technology. And the we I'm referring to is the United States government. And let me be very clear to all of the conspiracy theorists out there and all the net people that are putting out their wonderful theories, the United States has the highest technology in military in the world. No other country has a higher technology than us. Not Russia, not China, not Peru, not Somalia, not Mexico, not Cuba. No other country has higher tech than we have. And so if we do not have the tech shown in the, in the Tic Tac footage, no country has it. Which means we're not saying it's extraterrestrial, but it's extraterrestrial. So that's where things were as of June 25th, exactly where the DOD wanted it, all right? We're off the hook. We've given the public report. The Congress has the classified report. They'll decide what to do it. They will hold the hearings. The witnesses will bring out the information, not us because it's not our job. So the strategy is going fine. Carson twice says, we should have hearings. Why should that matter? Because Andrew Carson just is some backwater uh, uh, committee chair. He is the subcommittee chair in the House Intel, House Intel operations for counterintelligence, counter, oh God, counterintelligence, and I forget, that's a major committee. So it's non-trivial. He's the first one. No one else has really called for hearings yet, but I expect that to happen, maybe not right away. So that was fine. As far as the witnesses, let me share a different perspective, Bob. The witnesses are going to be military witnesses. That's almost certain. Elizondo has been accumulating them for two years. God knows how many he has. By the way, recently in two podcasts, Lou Elizondo said repeatedly, we need to have hearings. We need to have hearings. He's now really putting the cards on the table. Now, why is this significant? One, military witnesses are the finest witnesses you can have. They took an oath to serve. They take an oath when they sit down at that committee table, all right? Their, their, their careers are vetted and known, where they served, how they served, what they did. 
you don't have that with civilian witnesses. They are the best and Steve. they will not li let me finish. They will okay. not lie. Okay. Let me finish. They will not lie. Why? Why won't they lie? Because they're military and they're sworn to serve this country. And so if some member of the committee gets rambunctious and says, uh, 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 Colonel, uh, tell me, uh, are they building a, 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 a re-engineered vehicles somewhere in, a, in, a, in an underground facility? They don't have to lie. They'll never have to lie. All that witness will say is, Senator, with respect to that question, I cannot answer in public. I can discuss that answer in private classified session. They will never have to lie. They're not going to lie in the public. It's going to understand that perfectly. So I need, I need to provide, again, this larger perspective. If someone wants to grasp where the hell this is going. So with, with you're, you're saying that the hearings are going to happen. I think the hearings will eventually happen. I think we're all at that stage. Hopefully they are going to happen. Are they going to be open or closed door? You've, you've just said then if they're military, they can get away with saying, I'm not going to say this in public senator i'm going to say this behind closed doors is that going to be is that going to be any good for the public that are watching this is it, i mean they're not really concerned about the ufo community obviously but i, I are think the they are going to put it with another blue book you know if, no, they, if no, they take no, no, this no. all behind closed doors and we don't get to hear about what's being said where does that get no. us Look, there's going to be classified hearings and unclassified hearings. i assure you they want unclassified hearings all right. The point of this thing is to get disclosure and to get it in a way that that is that is positive and constructive. And public hearings are absolutely essential. You need to have hundreds of millions of people. Right. Watching these military services with credentials, answering important questions that takes enormous pressure off the political risk. So they need that. But of course, some of it will be classified. And again, language is important here, John. Getting away with, a, a no, 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 no. They're not getting away with anything. They're simply doing what is correct. Meaning, if I can answer truthfully to your question, uh, I will. If it is classified matters, then I will have to answer privately in classified session. This has happened before. So the issue of lying or not lying is not in play at all. They're actually conducting themselves as they should and the public will respect that. So again, uh, uh, the, the, the hearings themselves will go pretty smoothly for a lot of reasons. I can go further into that, but what has to happen and what will happen is that the world will participate in the final acts of ending the truth embargo. These hearings allow that participation. It allows the Congress to participate. It allows the members of Congress and of these committees to act appropriately there, this isn't going to be 35 Benghazi hearings, hyper-political, political nonsense. It, th these are going to be hearings in which every member has no reason to put on a dog and pony show. These are national security matters and military witnesses. They can be on their best behavior. The political risk will be minimal. And so you'll see these men and women acting the way they should asking intelligent questions, getting intelligence answers. And everybody's, uh, how would you say, karma is going to improve. Everybody's political standing is going to improve. It is win, 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 win. That is why Mellon wants these hearings. That is why Elizondo wants these hearings. That is why the Department of Defense wants these hearings. I mean, I can tell you stuff going on at the IG right now that's unbelievably unprecedented. Again, if, if you understand the whole picture, you realize we're not even close to 1969. That might have been 200 years ago. That is not what is going on right now. What is going on right now is a lot of good people are trying to end this goddamn truth embargo in the middle of a worsening pandemic and at the end of a four-year political fiasco right, that has undermined and damaged every aspect of the American institutions and get the job done anyway. And we will because that's America, even in the worst circumstances, ultimately, as as Winston Churchill said, we do the right thing after we've explored every other alternative. And I assure you, we have explored every other alternative. I want to strongly support Steve, something Steve said that none of us have emphasized that is 
really important. In 1969, we did not have the statutes that currently govern the inspector generals. Right. And Danny Sheehan and those guys going to the inspector generals, that has inserted a skeleton key into the weird, weird arcane closet with secrets yep. in it. I just don't know how much will come out. But if any of the reports of uh, people going to them and complaining that there's lots of secrets about Roswell and the IG people talking about going and looking at all that, that would be cool. But the IG laws, the inspector general laws right. and how they're being invoked are a massive change from how things were before. And okay. gen gentlemen, I, 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 I am very honored to have been here. Unfortunately, I have another engagement and I'm going to drop off in about a minute. And Steve is, and, and Ross, is a, it's an honor to be on with you and have two really bright and well-known people uh, straighten, help straighten out all of this. Thank you, Bob. I appreciate that. And thank you for your time, Bob. Very much Cheers, appreciated. Bob. Yep. Take care. I'd like to, like to pick up on where Bob just went. Look, I, I've had quite a few talks with Danny Sheehan, so I have some sense of what's going on at the IG. Would you like to know? Please. Yeah, okay. that is where I was going. This, this, is, this is fascinating stuff, man. I mean, I'm telling you, when, when, the, when the full story comes out, when people, when people can talk and documents can be revealed, I'll tell you, it's going to make some really riveting uh, uh, stuff. Okay, again, strategically. Let's think strategically. Okay, so... The last three years, uh, not surprisingly, ever since the TTSA was announced, there was a significant courtier within the military intelligence complex that was going, what the fuck? Who ordered that, right? Are you kidding me? Ah, right, and they go, okay, we gotta stop this, okay? Let's get out there, let's put an end to this right now, okay? Let's pull these guys. Unfortunately, they, they, they surprised them. The TTSA was held relatively private. There was only a few things that leaked it, and, and the, the worst leak was the WikiLeaks stuff, which didn't specifically refer to what was gonna happen. It just indicated that Tom DeLong and, and, and uh, John Podesta were spending a lot of time communicating with each other. And then of course, the, the, the FBI report come out, the election happens, and so the press couldn't really get on that. They had to focus on what was happening. And so, okay. So when the TTSA finally launches in, in, in October of 2017, it caught most people by surprise. And so the, the opponents inside are, I don't know, they're calling each other up, they're emailing, what are we gonna do? Are we gonna? But before they could get it together to, to create a serious pushback, it's too late. The New York Times had the stories. They had vetted them and they published them. And when those stories were published, it was too late. They could not stop it. Okay. So they went pretty much silent. There was very little pushback. There was confusion in the DOD that the, the spokespeople didn't know what to say and they're giving the wrong answers and all this kind of stuff. But by and large, there was no pushback. All right, so they're gliding along for three years, but it's not happening and they're going, okay, maybe it'll all blow off, maybe it'll all blow off, but it wasn't. So there was some stuff going on within the DOD, primarily on Elizondo. He was the key player, no question. He was DIA. By the way, Mellon also worked with the DIA, uh, not coincidentally. And so they were trashing him internally. And I think, I think, I think, and he was getting trashed externally by people in the ET community that didn't get the picture and decided, okay, whatever. So he's the guy that has taken the worst of it, frankly. And so, but he knew it. He knew what was going on. And so not at some point, as you may recall, the Department of Defense announced, and this is again a strategic move, that they had made the decision to, to place the organization and in the, in the, in the compliance with Rubio's request in the hands of the IG office, the Inspector General. Why? Because the Inspector General's office is massive and it's supposedly independent. It's independent of the functions of the DOD. So essentially they're saying, look, we're gonna help make this look more authentic and, 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 and take some of the, the, the controversy out of it, returning it over the IJ. Great, so they did that. Well, not long after that, Elizondo makes a move. He essentially kind of approaches the idea, IG about the fact that, you know, I'm getting trashed by some people here. There's been some misstatements and it's undermining my credibility, et cetera, et cetera, and I want to address it. 
Well, he had a legitimate reason to do that, and they, they had to listen to him. So he, he approaches the IG with his complaints about uh, we need to stop this stuff that's going on. Okay, fine. You think that was the reason? I don't think so. I think he, he didn't want that. He didn't want people trashing him, but that was the least of his problems. So now he's in the IG's office and he's talking about that problem. Well, naturally, since he's dealing with something like that, I need an attorney. And so he hires Danny Sheehan, one of the legendary legal activists of all time, who, who, was, who was a rock star in the 70s and 80s. He was involved in every major friggin' case there was, Iran-Contra, the, the, the Pentagon Papers, the Silkwood case, I could go on. And he was doing it all through an organization called the Christic Institute. I was there at the time. He was the biggest pain in the ass that the government was dealing with, I assure you. And so eventually they got him. They got Danny. Uh, they, they, what they did was they just sent in a couple of accountants. So we need to check the books. And they look at the books and they go, hmm, I see something wrong here. They then take it to a judge. The judge calls them in and says, we've looked at the books. And apparently you have violated all the rules of a nonprofit. And so you now need to pay taxes on every single penny the Christic Institute has been given. Hundreds of thousands of dollars in back taxes and fees. Well, ball game over. Place is bankrupt, which put Danny in a tough spot. Except, and he's done this before, Lawrence Rockefeller, remember Lawrence, steps in and pays the bill, which frees Danny up to leave town, go west, and start doing legal activism there, where he had been for all of these years, involved in very important projects, but he wasn't at the center of the stage. But something else happened. In 2020, Danny made the decision to step into this issue. I was there when it happened. I put him on Art Bell almost immediately, and he told his story about his involvement in the, in the uh, President Carter study. He told his story about going to see the Blue Book files, and he has been with us for all of that time. The last 20, this was 2000, 21 years. He has stayed in the ET issue all of that time, even though it probably wasn't helping him with some of his other work. Why did Danny do that? Because Danny's got four degrees from Harvard. That's four degrees more than I have. And Danny basically said, this is the biggest issue in history. And one day I'm going to be in the center of this. And guess what? That's exactly where he is. So he is hired by Lou Elizondo, and now he's in the IG office. Now, guess what's happened since then? Do you think they're in there going to make sure that Lou Elizondo doesn't get some shade directed at him by some desk jockeys in the Pentagon? I don't think so. Here's what I learned from Danny recently, and I'm not breaking any confidences because Danny has been talking about this all over the place. He's been in some multiple Zooms and single Zooms and everything else. After he gets in there, they start talking about the report. You know, how are things going here? And Lou Express has some concerns about that, and that's okay. So Danny suggests to him, I'm loving this, he suggests, look, you know, the IG is huge. And by the way, it is because the Pentagon is bigger than most countries. OK, and they're, they're, they're in charge of its you know, ethical positions. And he says, look, you've got all these divisions in the IG. So if we're going to talk about this, why don't you bring in the heads of all these divisions so we can all talk together? And so Danny and Elizondo were in there standing and sitting and, and they're in the in the room is the heads of all of the IG departments and they're talking about the Pentagon going here. Tell me when that happened in the past. Okay, and so essentially what they created on that side is a beautiful flaking, and I apologize, Ross. I, 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 I am, I'm awful at this in terms of short answers. They created a flanking maneuver literally in the IG office at the same time that the, they're releasing the, the study to the public and to the Congress. Now, exactly where that flanking movie is going, but let me tell you this. Based upon the report that I believe they gave the, uh, the seven committees, based upon the strategy they're exhibiting, based upon the fact that they're in the IG over there with, with, with Annie Sheehan, I'm going to say it again. The Department of Defense is thrown in the towel. 
it basically knows it's over. And so it's just a matter of how the DOD handles its affairs, how this goes forward, so the DOD looks good and responsible and the public are going to be pleased with it. And so if the DOD is thrown in the towel, aside from the pandemic and the other political nonsense going on, disclosure is now inevitable. I promise not to say anything for at least 10 minutes. <laughs> no, that was great. Thank you, Steve. It's, that's a prospect. I, look, I, I have to say, Steve, you make me feel more optimistic. I didn't know that about um, that's my the, the detail of, um, of Danny's uh, conversations with the IG. I've, I've had the pleasure. I met Danny yeah. properly for the first time. I've spoken to him many times over the phone and over Zoom, but I got to know him very well. Uh, I attended the Greer event in uh, Arizona in late April. And uh, the, by far the, the absolute best experience for me was getting to know Danny Sheehan, who's a hero of mine. I, I remember I studied law uh, in the 80s, and I, I remember reading about Daniel Sheehan and thinking, wow, I, I, you know, he's my pinup. You know, he's the sort of guy I want on my wall because he really is. He's got balls. He's, um, he, he's a strategic thinker, and he definitely knows um, – how to play the Congress. Uh, one of the things that uh, he told me was how Marcia Smith, who was the space policy advisor for Carter, um, used him to help lobby inside the Congress to help secure the funding for CETI, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence when that funding came under some threat. And um, yeah, there, I, I agree there are reasons for optimism now that um, Danny's engaged. And when I was talking to Elizondo, Lou Elizondo in... Um, in May, Lou was going through the process of engaging with the Pentagon and the IG. And I can tell you, there's no complacence on Lou Elizondo's part. He's, he's certainly feeling the heat. And I, I, I must confess, I, I got the impression on occasion that um, Lou would be rather doing something else because it's a very lonely job that he's doing. And it's quite a courageous job because he's going up against some extremely powerful people in the Pentagon. One issue that I don't think that we've looked at yet, and I, I think it needs to be discussed, and this was emphasized to me by somebody in my government very recently who's aware of some of these discussions inside the Pentagon. And that is why there is this resistance from as I understand it, the CIA and the US Air Force to any kind of public admissions. And the excuse that's being put, certainly to my government by senior people in the American government, is that there is an unwillingness to show a hand to strategic adversaries, China, Russia, because there's a essentially there's a cold war going on at the moment. There's a there's a battle going on at the moment for the um, uh, the technology that lies the the golden nugget that lies at the bottom of this rainbow. Um, I believe it is the case that the United States has recovered some kind of to use the words Elizondo's used exotic material, possibly non-terrestrial material some kind of advanced technology. And I certainly believe the US has been trying to re-engineer that technology despite official denials. I've spoken to far too many people who've said to the contrary, good senior people who've admitted privately to me that yes, the, the United States is engaged in an effort to try and replicate technology, which is if, if they can replicate that technology, that gives them a strategic advantage, which um, I think, frankly, is good news for all democracies, um, bad news for authoritarian governments. But the um, it, my hard-nosed view of this is that the United States is kind of split on this issue and that certainly the Republicans that I've engaged with are drawn to the argument that there is merit in keeping as much of this under wraps as possible. And so if what we're talking about is public congressional hearings, then I'm gloomy, I'm pessimistic. But when, as Steve said, there's the possibility that, that military officials will be deposed and go to private classified hearings where they testify what they know, I'm much more optimistic. I, I, I do think, and I've spoken to some of them, I do think that there are people who are prepared to testify who will reveal 
astonishing things, but they won't do it in open hearing. And the reason why I think is largely to do with the unwillingness to give away any information at all to, to strategic rivals. Because um, the way it's been explained to me, there are um, enormous efforts being made, particularly in Russia right now, uh, to try and replicate their own technology, to try and get the same advances. Um, and I think the, uh, the real risk for the planet is if authoritarian regimes secure this technology before the United States does. And so I can, I, I hate saying this as a journo because I'm very much a fan of transparency and openness, but I can also see, and I've seen this many times in my career, many times as a journalist, I've resisted publishing something because I don't want to jeopardize um, a national security issue that, that I'm aware of, that I've learned about as a result of my research, that frankly, I don't want to be accused of compromising the, the broader public interest in making sure that secrets are preserved. And there are secrets that are worth preserving. And so I can understand to some degree, there are hard heads in the Air Force in particular who don't want certain information revealed. But yeah, if you can see the, the way to a classified hearings where people say, I'm willing to testify to this committee in closed hearing, yeah, I, I think that that's probably going to happen. But what's the public going to find out about it? I get the impression sometimes on UFO Twitter that, that people think that that this is all about just dumping a bucket of information out there as fast as possible and not really paying too much regard to the issue of what damage it does to the strategic national interests of the United States. Nobody's ever going to reveal information in a way that compromises the United States' ability to secure a strategic advantage on this issue. And so uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know enough about Washington politics to, to understand this. Steve can probably shed a bit more light on this. But my, my worry is, is that, yes, there probably will be admissions made in classified hearings, and they probably already have been. Well, I know that they have been. There have been admissions made. Certainly, no member of Congress that I've engaged with in my research was in the least bit surprised by the admissions that were made by the, uh, the Pentagon to the, United, the New York Times that essentially this technology cannot be explained by either American technology, Russian technology, or Chinese technology. It is not a technology that is known to any major power on this planet. And um, I think that in, in and of itself is a breathtaking admission by the United States military. It really is. And I think we've, we're, we've actually come a long way. It's quite something that the United States is actually, as Steve says, made that admission. That, that this isn't Russian, it's not Chinese, and it's not American. But what I know, and I've spoken to some of them, some people in the United States Air Force are very, very worried about giving away too much publicly. And they're not going to allow themselves to be bullied uh, by any degree of public uh, disclosure into revealing things that they don't want to reveal. So uh, I've been told, for example, that the Russians have got a very active re-engineering project somewhere in the Ural Mountains and that they are trying desperately to do what the Americans have been trying desperately to do for the last, pretty much the last 70 years, replicate stuff that they've recovered many, many years ago. And, and uh, it's not as easy as it looks. Ross, uh, hasn't this only been going on for the last 20 years? Am I mistaken? <laughs> Didn't the report say it was only 20 years ago? And that's the other thing too. I mean, I, 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 I'm, I'm really fascinated by the fact that the um, ODNI report has basically constrained the narrative to 2004 on. And the other issue, and it, I know it's an unpopular issue, but it's got to be talked about, is the fact that the public has been lied to. Uh, there have been deceits imposed on the American public because of a national security imperative, which meant that it was okay to lie. And I remember one of the most illuminating things in my naivety, I asked both Elizondo and Mellon in the very first part of my interviews with them. I asked them, I said, this, this is a lie. You know, essentially on, on its face, we already know that the American public have been deceived and lied to. You know, the American president's office, the White House put out a, a press release in 2011 
falsely asserting that, that, that there was yeah. no evidence of an extraterrestrial presence on planet Earth. And, I'm and, the one that got that release. <laughs> that was released to me, in a way. And, and, that's, and, that, and look, you know, all credit here to Steve, quite frankly, because, you know, you, mate, you're the Don Quixote. You've been tilting at this windmill for so many, so many decades, and I, 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 I don't know how you've kept the stamina going on it because um, it, it's very, very hard to, to maintain a belief that there is ever going to be a disclosure. But I do think we're much more advanced than we ever were before. But the, 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 the issue that I think lies at the back of this, I don't think that there are malevolent Pentagon generals who are basically trying to conceal for their own d dastardly advantage. I think they're doing it out of a sense of patriotism. They're doing it because they want the United States to be the dominant military power as it has been since World War II. And there's a huge fear that the technology that is represented by what is potentially behind this is so important that it's okay to lie. It's been okay to lie for many, many years. Um, and they'll keep on lying again if necessary. Uh, what we have to do to achieve a result is provide those gatekeepers with a reason to disclose publicly let alone you know, set aside private admissions to the Congress, which my understanding are already happening. Um, the, the issue is why, why should the public be told? You know, we, 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 imagine if we were at this stage during the Manhattan Project in World War II, and imagine the United States was in the process of developing the first atomic bomb. There would have been absolutely no imperative for the government at the time to make any admissions. And I, I, I think we're at that stage at the moment, is that, um, you know, we have to provide a reason. There, there has to be a reason for the public to know. I think also... Well, you we, don't, we don't actually need the technology, do we? We don't need them to say, here's the technology and give us all the secrets of the technology. They can say, these are who we believe they are. Yes, they are here. We don't know why they're here, if that's the case. They can give us things like that. They can tell us we're not alone in the universe. You know, there are, there are things they can do. Well, look, I, one of the things that I'm painfully aware of from my day job is, as a journo, I engage with a lot of people in defence and intelligence in my country. And the thing that really alarms me is the way that people who have an understanding of current intelligence talk about the inevitability of the coming conflict, particularly with China. And I think a lot of what is driving the Pentagon's thinking on this at the moment is the perception that we are slowly but surely moving into a military confrontation with China, which, uh, God forbid, I mean, I couldn't think of anything worse. But, um, you know, there are people in my military that I engage with during my research for the book who... Who's, who, who said to me, you cannot view this in the prism of, you know, just whether or not the United States has got a secret jacked up on blocks in the back of a cave in Area 51. What you've got to look at is the United States wants to preserve as much as possible any advantages that it already has in the event of any confrontation with China. And and I, 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 I'm quite shocked by the degree to which people talk about the inevitability of some kind of conflict, albeit limited, with China. And if I was China, I mean, one of the things as well that's been going on is an enormous degree of um, espionage. I mean, uh, uh, I'm privy to the fact that there was an incredible cyber operation mounted against Australia's um, uh, defence agencies and is still happening. And why is that happening? It's happening because China has perceived that it is behind in a large number of areas. Most of its fighters are current ripoffs of stolen technology from the United States. Um, uh, I think the world is slowly waking up to the fact that that um, the Chinese have been running an extraordinarily long game plan espionage operation against the West for quite a few years now. And um, uh I think there's nervousness inside the US administration about showing your hand too closely. 
And frankly, if I was a Pentagon planner, if I was a senior general in the US Air Force, looking at engaging with Chinese fighters over the Taiwan Strait in the next three to four, five years, I, I would be wanting to keep as little information in the public domain as possible. Um, boy, uh, Go for it. You're, I wish I could just, I wish I wish you and I could get together for a dialogue on stage in front of a big audience. We could have some fun. Let me, let me assuage some of your, your concern here. Uh, first of all, the, uh, the United States, China, and the Soviet Union, Russia, have had access to ET, ET technology going back decades. Uh, every one of these nations knows the other has access to the ET technology. And we know that they know that we know that they have access. That's point one. Point two, espionage is the only thing that's, is one of the key things that's prevented a nuclear war. Right? We should be thankful we have espionage. It was critical. Why? Because if it wasn't for spying, good spying, then each of the major powers, the three major, because there's now eight nuclear powers, soon to be nine, uh, would be sitting there not knowing what the hell the other's doing. What kind of bomb have they got? Where are they? We don't know. We have no idea. Maybe we should strike first. But by spying on each other like crazy, we had a pretty good idea where everybody is. They got they got the nuclear secrets early on. Forty, they, had, they got the atomic and uh, hydrogen bomb information directly from us. They they knew about Roswell from us, and so all that spying helped to assuage the paranoia. In other words, we know what you're up to. Okay, fine. So uh, we're not going to get upset or get worried and launch a nuclear weapon. So so the fact that China is spying, great. Now, admittedly, if you get caught, particularly if, if you're a, a, a turncoat, meaning a Russian spying on Russia, you're going to get killed. And that's just the nature of the game. So there's nothing really new there. Okay. Now, in terms of the uh, technological advantage, yeah, that's always an issue. And I happen to totally agree with you that essentially I believe there is, at this point, there is no chance of getting out of the 20th century without a nuclear war. A nuclear war is inevitable in this century as things stand. And that's a big problem, isn't it? Because a nuclear war would definitely be upsetting uh, and, dis and disruptive. So we don't want that. We don't want a nuclear war. Which brings us to the matter of disclosure. Another important point. The purpose of the disclosure advocacy movement, as I came to define it, and I, I, I know other people disagree, but I like my definition, is nothing more than the confirmation of the extraterrestrial presence. And if we have hearings, they will be in that sense, meaning provide, provide testimony, violate no, no not non-disclosure agreements, Anything that is classified has to be in a classified setting. But the point of all these witnesses coming in is to provide the basis for the president to confirm the extraterrestrial presence. That's all. It's not about let's have the hearings in order to get all this information out. And once we know about all the ET stuff and everything, the president will disclose. That's backwards. Divide the world up into two parts, pre-disclosure, post-disclosure. You have to do that. And you've got to say what's going to happen in pre-disclosure, what's going to happen in post-disclosure. What can only happen in pre-disclosure, what can only happen in post-disclosure. All right. Pre-disclosure, no. We're not going to get uh, 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 the super secret stuff that we've done with ETs. We're not going to get into contact. We're not going to see craft. We're just going to get the necessary testimony that will allow the, the, the president to disclose. And then in the post-disclosure world, we'll all decide... Everybody will have a say about what should we know next and what can come out. So that's one way to think about this. And the other aspect is this. Um, the ETs are part of this process. The ETs are not just bystanders here. And so when we talk about the disclosure process, when we talk about what we should do, we can't leave them out. Steve, right, can I so just ask you a quick, quick question? Here? Yeah. You, you actually believe there is ET? Of I mean, because I mean, everyone is basically saying, I mean, for the last 
year, two years now, it, it, it seems to have moved on that more, more people are believing that it, the chances are this is dimensionals because these are, these are things that are just appearing anywhere that, at any time, whenever they want, you know. Hey, look, uh, uh, look, first of all, I don't, look, if, I don't care whether you come from another dimension, whether you come from the future, if you weren't born in Milwaukee or Moscow or Jakarta, or your relatives weren't born there, then you're extraterrestrial. I mean, I don't want to split those hairs. I assure you, the, con the, 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 the implications are just as powerful. But let me put it this way. You buy one lottery ticket, you, got, you could win the lottery. The odds are about 140 million to one. You want to put your money down on time travelers? Go ahead. The odds are so badly against you that you're not going to win. You want to put it down on uh, uh, extra dimensionals? There's a chance. Living inside the earth, there's a chance. But if you want to make any money, you take other planets, right? And you won't even get good odds. It'll be like, I don't know, bet 100 to get 55. So I'm going to go with the odds on this. All right. And, I, and, 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 and again, I it really ultimately change. doesn't matter. Saying. Okay. Okay. So the, the point I'm making is this. And, and the, the, there's going to be stuff coming on about this pretty soon. Look, I understand all of these all of these political issues and all of the problems in the world and all the stupid things we've done and the risk of nuclear war and the risk of everything. I get it. But history is history. OK, when when they when they figured out and started to break the atom, when they started to realize how atoms worked uh, and also the development of relativity, the turn of the 19th century to the 20th century. They didn't sit down and go, you know. Is the world ready for this? There's so many problems. Should we should we maybe stop looking at atoms and just going to put that aside? Let's forget this relativity thing. Let's just keep the status quo. No. History is filled with these kinds of trends and massive changes, paradigm shifts. And when they come, they come. And they're like the tide. You can stand on the on the on the sand in front of the ocean and you can say, we got a whole lot of problems here. I don't know what the hell we're going to do. So we need the tide to stay out for a while. Don't come in. Come in a couple years from now. Uh-uh. The tide comes in, and there's not a damn thing you can do about it. History is unfolding, and all these other reasons are ultimately irrelevant. But it's worth noting some key things. Every major nation in the world knows there's an extraterrestrial presence and has known for decades, going all the way back to the 40s. How come they know without having any crash vehicles? Because... All of the na nations of the world of any consequence since the 40s have air forces. Those air forces are designed to defend the territory. Those air forces are sent up all the time to intercept these bogeys. They have been filming these damn things for 50, 60 years. And I mean every country, UK, France, Canada, China, Russia, every one of them. They have files and files of gun camera footage just like the Nimitz just like the Roosevelt, in their vaults, and they never release them. Why? Because they know to release those gun camera clips, not two seconds, not 30 seconds, 20, 40 minutes, an hour. If they release that gun camera footage, it ends the truth embargo, and the United States did not want the truth embargo ended. But those film clips are there. And so does France know the ET presence? Yes. All of these nations do. So, you're, so what you have is a global cooperative deciding we don't want to confirm the ET presence yet. So it's not like if we do this, everybody's going to go, oh, my God, and do stupid stuff. No, they're going to basically say, finally, you've ended this so we can pay attention to something else. So it's not that disruptive. But here is the real punchline. I believe that, it, uh, that a nuclear war is inevitable in this century based upon our behavior, our politics, and, and how we are conducting our affairs. The only thing that could prevent it, in my view, is a major historical paradigm shift, the magnitude of disclosure. Disclosure is a change capable of altering enough equations, enough behavior, and enough worldview that we will make it through the century, we will not have a nuclear war, and we might have no nuclear weapons whatsoever before the century is out. Okay, fine. That sounds great, Steve. What has it got to do with ETs? Well, it has a lot to do with ETs. Because the most important single thing we know about extraterrestrials is not that they probe human beings 
not that they put cop circles down in the UK, not that they occasionally take animals and drain them of blood and take special tissues. It's all interesting. The most important thing we know is that repeatedly, over and over again, they have put their craft over nuclear facilities and turned off the missiles. Not only here, but in the Soviet Union and in Russia, and we think in China, though it's harder to know that because China is pretty tight with information like that. We have dozens of witnesses prepared to confirm this in front of Congress tomorrow. Is that some sort of really impossible uh, thing that can't happen because it's national security? No. These witnesses have been testifying to this for 20 years. Some of them gave a press conference in the National Press Club in 2010. They, it's all out there. It's all been out there. There's been books. There's been documentaries. It's a totally known thing. So you might say, well, then why hasn't the Congress held hearings? Because if the Congress were to bring those witnesses in and hold hearings, the truth embargo would end. But guess what? These witnesses are at the top of the list of the hearings that are to come. They're being prepared. I know this personally. All right. And so what is the point here? Why do the extraterrestrials keep turning our missiles off and on occasion turning them on which scares the bejesus out of every single person in that sack site i mean turning them off is one thing turning them on is another and then they let them be turned off why are they doing this i we don't know for sure but i can tell you there's a consensus among the military witnesses to this pretty much already and that consensus will come out in the hearings. They are turning them off because they're making a very simple statement. If you want to be part of our world, if you want to in be engage this galaxy as we do, you cannot do that if you destroy your civilization with these weapons. You will become nothing more than a third world, fourth world, sixth world country. And it might take a thousand years for us to give a damn what you do. And so don't do that. More importantly, if you think that you need those weapons to somehow defend yourselves against us because everything is an enemy to you, forget about it. You haven't got a snowball's chance, right? So forget that. So you can't harm us. All you can do is harm yourself, right? You're almost certainly going to do that. And so we're turning these weapons off to let you know you had better get on the disclosure train, get the announcement out so we can move to the next level, which is open contact, and talk about these damn nukes you have. Now, some people think that's nothing but science fiction. It isn't. The evidence for this strategy is clear. The witnesses are there. The documentation is there. It's all there. That is what is going down. And so anybody inside, you know, kind of comes forward, say the Air Force, and say, oh, no, 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 no. We can't talk about this because people will learn that, that the ETs can turn our weapons off. We already know it. Or we can't talk about this because we need an edge on the Chinese. What edge? What's going to be our edge, right? We're going to be able to hit them with a few more nukes than they hit us? No. <laughs> The entire concept of mutual assured destruction, which we created to somehow stay alive in the 20th century, was one of the most asinine things we ever came up with. It's nonsense. It's ridiculous. It's absurd. But it did work. But it's not going to work any longer. And so the extraterrestrials didn't escalate their activity in 47 because I don't know. They were getting bored. They haven't maintained that engagement for 74 years because they had nothing better to do. And they're not turning off our nukes simply because it makes them feel special. There <laughs> is a strategy here, not only with the extraterrestrials, but with our national security people. And we're doing the best we can. The point is that we're on the verge of winning. And so I'm not really sympathetic with all the reasons why we can't win now, all the reasons why it won't work this time, all the reasons why it ain't going to happen. No, we're winning. And so what I'm saying to the human race and the American government and the UFO committee, we're winning. Accept the victory, right? Accept the victory and be humble in victory. And let's move on with civilization. 
there are 10,000 reasons why this may not work. There's 10,000 reasons why we'll never get through this century, except there's one damn good reason why we will. And so we need to focus on that reason. I need people lining up behind disclosure. I need people supporting Lou Elizondo. I need people pointing out the good aspects of how we're dealing with this. I need people to focus on Marco Rubio and his call for the reports, not some other senator some, uh, 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 somewhere else going, well, you know, he probably can't do this, whatever. Let's focus on how we're winning, not how we might lose. Steve, would you agree that there's um, a general, uh, there's, there's a sort of apathy from the general public towards this subject? I'm not I'm talking about outside the realms of ufology, uh, just Joe Bloggs, man on the street. My mum yeah. and dad, for example, <laughs> they're wife. fairly apathetic. Yeah, <laughs> and my wife. They're fairly <clears throat> apathetic to the gun camera footage. And this report, with all these admissions, have just been released. Which, so you do, do you agree there's an apathy? And no. If no. so, no. No. Oh, my okay. God. The level of interest in this subject is unprecedented. It's off the chart. Mm -hmm. Okay, look, um, since, since the TTSA was announced, the New York Times has written 26 articles on the UAP subject. The Washington Post has done 36 articles, okay? The polls are showing that the level of people that are now convinced that it's real and, and, and ET are higher than ever. All right. Over around the world, hundreds of millions of people have been reading these articles, watching this stuff. Now, does that mean they're running out in the street with signs and stuff? No, 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 no. Oh, but they're interested. Okay. Let me tell you something else. Since 1951, the highest grossing genre in all of Hollywood film, generating counting uh, movie volume, movie, uh, movie gross, uh, adjusted for inflation, of course, television advertisement and product sales. You know what the highest grossing genre in all of film is? It's extraterrestrials. My research shows it's approaching $100 billion, okay? Right now, there are four major projects regarding the ET issue going on in Hollywood right now, which is why I'm sitting in a Motel 6 in Hollywood right now. Three of them drop in early August, and it's just the beginning. You have no idea what is coming. I can also tell you that some of the biggest people in Hollywood, legends, okay, giants, hundred millionaires are now digging into this subject and are about to bring you content. All right, that's for openers. And so, uh, when you, when you judge, you know, when you're trying to judge a, 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 the public's enthusiasm, try to keep in mind that this is a long game and there's a lot of ups and downs. Keep in mind that the pandemic is now killing people in bigger numbers. The people have got a lot on their plate. But let me tell you, the interest in this subject is unprecedented. And if we were to hold hearings, in other words, if, if 10, 10 military witnesses were to appear in front of the Senate Intel Committee, say, 30 days from now, and it was announced about two weeks in advance, the number of people watching those hearings will probably exceed a billion. How a prepared billion. are we? Ross, yep. you spoke to Christ, Christopher Mellon um, when you interviewed him, and I've basically been told by two people that Chris Mellon has compiled a list of people that should go before the hearings. Um, did, he, did he discuss that with you? Um, who was on that list or whether that list exists? No, they he also didn't, compiled a list I, of questions. He didn't, but I've spoken to people who've told me they are on that list and that they are prepared to testify. Yeah. Um, uh, I, I, gosh, I just, I just want to address some of the things Steve's been saying there because uh, I mean, one of the things I love about you, Steve, is you're very, very optimistic, and um, and it, it gives me hope because um, uh, I. I wish I could feel the same level of optimism. Um, I, I, I think um, I think there's a good, strong possibility in light of what Steve's saying that that we're going to have maybe within a year. You say months, but I think maybe within a year because I do think the pandemic's going to get worse. <laughs> um, I do think there's going to be some kind of uh, hearing started on the hill. But the assumption that I think is implicit behind all of this is that there's going to be congressional hearings where military officials are deposed in public session. 
I'm not I'm not persuaded that we're going to see that degree of candor. And funnily enough, one of the subject matter materials that's been raised here today that I, I was fascinated with as a younger man was the Iran Contra hearings, and it fascinated me that um, that there was a public version of Iran Contra. And having at the time I did interviews for a documentary 20 years ago where we looked at the fact that there was a private version of, of, of Iran-Contra. Mm -hmm. And there were views taken that there were certain things that couldn't be discussed in public forum that, that were properly discussed in private hearing. And that's what I suspect is going to happen with this matter. Because, look, there's two issues here. One is control of the technology. And the other issue is the deceit that's been pulled on the American public, the lies that have been told. They're not crimes necessarily. I suspect there have been crimes committed along the way, but um, essentially, um, you know, there is going to be a reckoning about the fact that the American public has been deceived. If this sure. is truly the case, if there is an extraterrestrial yeah. uh, presence on planet Earth and if there's been an engagement with that extraterrestrial presence far more than what we know at the moment, then... The public's going to be outraged, um, but I, I, I don't. I, I, my, my issue is I don't know necessarily, and I, I, I'm strongly on this view. I, I don't think that in the people that I've engaged with in the Congress, and I've spent a lot of time sitting on the phone talking to staffers, and in a couple of cases, congressmen. I don't get the feeling that this is a very high priority in 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 Washington. Um, uh, I, I, it's funny, I, somebody mentioned earlier, I think, Steve, you said that um, every world, major world government is aware of this issue. Uh, I can tell you that our prime minister is not, our, our senior defence minister is not, uh, and we're plugged into the Five Eyes Alliance. And I, 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 get the, I get the impression also I've engaged with people in the British government and... Um, the Canadian government, I don't get the impression that there is even a, 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 an awareness or a, a political imperative to even give this any kind of emphasis at all. Um, I, I, I hope I'm wrong, uh, but the, um, the the reality is is that the the power brokers at the moment in in governments around the world are <coughs> focused on the pandemic. They're focused on China. If, you know, they're, they're, they're worried about nuclear proliferation. They're worried about bioweapons. Um, and indeed, one of the subtexts behind all of this is, um, you know, all the conspiracy theories about the, um, the, the bioweapons laboratories that are sort of behind the, um, the, the release of the virus in the, in the first place, if, if it truly was in a laboratory. Um, so there's, I mean, the people I talk to who are telling me that, UAPs, the phenomenon of, um, you know, whether or not there is an extraterrestrial presence on planet Earth, it's it's not registering on the synapses of power brokers. So this may be a very Washington thing, uh, but I, I don't get the impression yet that it's an imperative that's being discussed around the cabinet table in a country like Australia, Britain, or the or the the Canadians or the or the New Zealanders, you know, for the other members of the Five Eyes. Um, as, as one former very senior minister in our government said to me here in Australia, Ross, if, if, if you know, and he said, he said it in a joking way, if, if there really is um, an awareness in America of some kind of extraterrestrial presence on planet Earth, they sure as hell haven't told us about it. And uh -huh. uh, oh boy. Uh, I, I, don't, I, I don't think that there is the broad consensus um, of a knowledge base amongst international governments on this issue. All I right. Let, let me let me explain why. Uh, by the way, the Australia has been very much involved with the United States on this issue. Uh, first of all, uh, let me clarify my statement. When I say every nation, every developed nation in the world is aware of the ET presence, I should caveat that. <clears throat> those <clears throat> those that are in a need to know, in every developed country in the world, are aware of the extraterrestrial presence. All right. Um, does that mean that the prime minister or the head of the nation is informed? No, it doesn't. It just means that within every nation in the world that has developed Air Force, they know. Then the question is, to what extent 
does that knowledge move up the, the, the ladder to the political class and so forth? And I think that varies from country to country. We know that in the United States, for instance, over this last 74 years, there were presidents that were pretty embriefed uh, on this and they knew quite a bit. And then we know there are presidents that weren't, all right? And so, but what's most important is not how many people in the political class know, is that does the, the, that government it, 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 within it, those that have a need to know, know about an ET presence? Yes, that is true. Now, let's say that you are a member of the Senate or you are a prime minister and you are aware of it. You have been briefed. This is, has been the most classified issue in the world not completely unknown to the public because the ETs come and go as they please. And Roth Colgert comes up and says, Mr. Prime Minister, uh, what do you know about the extraterrestrial stuff? Can you think of one reason why he would acknowledge that he knows anything? Absolutely not. They're not going to say that. That's the point, right? So even if they knew, they're not going to tell you because of what we call, I've come to call the truth embargo. The truth embargo is something you're gonna be hearing a lot more about in the future. It's a big deal and it's critical to this. And if one gets an understanding of the truth embargo, it's a little easier to understand why that person's not saying this or we don't know this. The truth embargo was real and it was pretty powerful. So that's one way to kind of get around some of the, the confusion that you have. And I understand that. Um, and and then the other issue is actually no. Uh, I'm, I, 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 I'm, I think that's a misrepresentation. I'm not saying I'm confused. I'm, I'm telling you. I mean, I, I'm you're sorry. Confused, I, you're I, confused I, that I these people disagree. aren't no, acknowledging let me, it. Let me let me finish. Yeah. I'm not confused. All right. I, I'm Excellent. absolutely certain. I'm absolutely certain that senior officials in our government are completely unaware of what you're talking about. Now it may very well be that there are people in our defence force or our intelligence services who are briefed. That may very well be the case. But I think at a political level, at a governmental level, this does not register. And I, I, I think also that's the case as well in the UK. And I think it's also the case in Canada. And uh, I, I don't believe that, that uh, if America is aware of this, I don't believe that there is a broad consensus of awareness amongst na international governments. I, I just don't. And uh, it's not me being confused. I'm telling you, I've engaged. I've, I've, I've approached politicians and spoken to people who trust me, and I've had conversations with them. And uh, I do not believe that there are prime ministers briefed into this. I, I, I just don't buy it. I'm sorry. I think it varies from country to country. Uh, by the way, you mentioned something about the public and, and the issue of lies. In other words, I'm aware of all of the rationales for non for non-disclosure. I mean, I'm aware of all of them, heard them all a million times. The the lie issue is important. If you if you go back and review polling that's been done all the way back to the 60s, I think there have been many polls, maybe 15, 20 top entities. Okay. You can you can see polls back around the 1980s where 80% of the people polled said they believe the government is not telling the truth about the phenomena. All right. In other words, American people have known going back 40, 50 years, the government's not telling the truth about it. So when they finally learn and get confirmed to them that the government's not telling the truth, it's not, I don't think you're going to be outraged. They're basically going to go, yeah, I knew that. I knew you weren't telling the truth, but it's nice to get a little truth now. So I'm, I'm not worried about the the, the, the outrage over the great lie <clears throat> is not a is is not a problem for the public, but I will I will and I and I and I'll say this too. Again, another way to try to grasp what's going on, <clears throat> and I and I can go into detail on this. The disclosure, <clears throat> forgive me. <clears throat> <clears throat> All of this mishigash that's happening right now, and there's so much happening all the articles that are coming out and I have them all on my website. You can go read all 1000 of them. Plus I've got 160 video clips of interviews of Mellon and all this and, 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 and news article interviews, 160. Uh, uh, all this Michigas is really can come boils down to this. 
and this is another phrase that I own and I trademarked and I expect to be paid handsomely, is this. <clears throat> what you're seeing is not some just simple truth-telling process. What you're seeing is a public relations driven extrication process. Meaning what? It means that the Pentagon and certain individuals in the political class, people in the military, even the CIA, have come to understand that the truth embargoes days are over, that it's going to end pretty soon. And that the fundamental truth is going to come out. Let's talk about that. In other words, the confirmation, yeah, they're not human. Not all the tech and all the in history, just that, right? Because the rest is another matter. And so knowing that, and I don't blame them for this, every, every one of the agencies wants to look as good as possible. They want this to go well. And, they, and, 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 and minimize the pain and the suffering. And I get it, it's public relations. How can we look good? And how can it be done responsibly as well? All right. And so one of the problems they have, and, and this, this is where the election comes in, is that in order to do this right, they, they literally have to lie their way out of the lie. They just can't come out and tell the truth. They need to move the thing forward. But in order to do that, there's questions they can't answer and there's things they have to avoid. And so they're, they're literally kind of lying their way out of the lie, but to higher purpose. All right. Now, the plan when the TTSA was put together, not by Tom DeLong, they, they, they engaged Tom DeLong, but Tom DeLong was not the one that put this together. When, when the TTS was formed, they came out, they had a brilliant plan. The plan was this. Hillary Clinton is knee deep in ET stuff. It's all over the news. She's going on television. Her husband's going on television. I was the reason for that. I'm the one that drove him out of cover. Most people don't know this. I was behind that damn media barrage. That was where it was coming from. Me. Me and my public relations person. Whatever. The point is that we drove him out of cover. It's all over the place. And they're seeing this go on and they're going, wow, it looks like she's going to go ahead and disclose. She's going to become the first woman president and she's going to force the action, which any president could have done. Every single president could have ended the truth embargo when they wanted, if they were willing to pay the political price, which was going to be big. Her husband wanted to, and he was literally dismissed out of hand. They brushed him aside as a bubba from Arkansas. Screw you. And they impeached him and attacked him. And he didn't get that legacy. She was going to get that legacy and they saw it coming. So they came up with a program, get up get a proxy organization out there, civilian that can do things we cannot do, back it up inside to give them some cover, deliver the stuff to the New York Times after she wins the election. All the media would descend on her during the transition period. Once she's in the White House, this thing will move very fast and we'll probably have the truth embargo finally finished. By, I don't know, April of 2017. When she lost the election, it blew everything sky high. And now they're sitting there, what the hell are we going to do? And they had two choices fundamentally. And I'm in the UK watching this. I'm going, what are they going to do? What are they going to do? They could have disbanded and said, look, we gave it a shot. Let's end this. Every one of us could be making big bucks with contracts. We could be doing just fine. We did, it, we, it didn't work. Let's cancel this. Instead, they decided to go forward, meaning they were going to go through hell. They were going to miss out on a lot of jobs their retirement wasn't going to be nearly as much fun. They said, we're going to stick this out through the Trump administration. And they did year after year, but they had to put up because now they were vulnerable. This thing was supposed to be over in five months. Now they're hanging out for four years, being attacked on the web, attacked on social media, attacked by anybody to come after them. And it gave the time for those inside the military intelligence complex opposed to this to see what they could do to undermine it or whatever the hell. They went through hell. Trust me. They went through hell, but they stuck it out. All right. And so that is why there, there's so many loose ends to this and why it's gotten rough and tough. And then the pandemic came along, but they stuck it out. Why? Because the fundamental goal is doable. We have the witnesses. We've briefed the members of Congress. They're on board. They're willing to go forward. Rubio has made his move. 
This is a Republican who plans on running for president. You're saying that there's no interest within the political class when a man running for president with a high profile goes ahead and calls for the report from the Congress of the O&I, right? You, you think he did that because, all right, what the hell? No, Rubio knows exactly what he's doing. And so, and, and he will be the lead here for a while until Mark Warner decides what he's going to do. And so we are practically there. All of the potential excuses why it can't happen are slowly fading away. We've got two problems right now. The, we are at the junction of two major critical bills. I, I, there are plenty of political things out there, but the voting rights bill is absolutely existential right now. And the infrastructure bill is very, very important. And we have a 50-50 Senate. Okay, so those have got to get done. They are going to end the filibuster rule and they pass the damn things. All right, that's what they're going to do. I assure you, they're going to end the filibuster rule. The Republicans are going to lose their mind and people are going to say, so what? And they're going to pass these bills. That'll be done. And hopefully in the next 30 to 45 days, the American people realize that dying of COVID in service to their political ideology is probably a bad move and they're going to get the damn vaccine. Opens the door then to go ahead with hearings, I hope, in a couple of months. That's what's going down, Roth. And, and I understand you've talked to a lot of people. Don't, don't try to understand this process by what this politician says or that person says. You've got to look at the larger picture. So if you get a few days on your hand, go on your, go on your schedule, go to my website. Go to the print media archive. Read the thousand articles that have been written about this since, since October of 1917. I assure you, there has been no series of articles like this ever published. And then watch a hundred videos uh, uh, that have been put out by the TTSA and also the interviews of these guys and see what they're saying. By the way, there's been 70 or 80 more of those that I haven't been able to get up. 30 of them have been just the last month. Just watch what these guys are saying. Listen to them and you realize where they're going. They can't just tell you explicitly what they want to do. El Elizondo has been pressured and pressured and pressured to say extraterrestrial. Please, Lou, just say they're extraterrestrial. And if you read, listen to what he's saying, he's going right up to that line and up to that line and he's almost crossed it. Danny is now speaking for him and he's crossing the line completely. Danny is practically saying the rest of the treasure. So you've got Danny Sheehan saying that. Lou is wanting to say that. Ellen is stay, El Melon is staying in the background. But guess who else is staying in the background? Biden. Why is Biden staying completely out of this? Biden was tipped off about the ET thing from Obama, who was tipped off about the ET stuff from the Clintons, right? He was in the Obama administration. He frozen on us, yeah. Steve. Steve, can you still hear us? Behind this, and DOD is definitely not behind this. I mean, the Navy are not okay. involved. The, sorry, the, the Air Force is not involved. The Army is not involved. The CIA is not, not true. involved. Not true. The Air, well, you want to know why the Air Force is not saying anything? Yeah. Why yeah. the Air I Force do. is being completely out of this? Right? The Air yeah. Force has the absolute worst record on this issue. It has the right. biggest public relations problem of any entity. All right, the Air Force has done so much awful stuff in, in service to this truth embargo than any other agency. So it's kind of staying out. The Navy is all over this thing. The Army signed up when it when it when it opened up that uh, agreed to do a CRADA, a cooperative research program with the TTSA, right? But yeah, the Air Force is staying out of this. Uh, as far as who's on board and who's not on board, look. The, 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 the ONI created a task force specifically to receive Rubio's request. They are servicing that request. The DOD is servicing that request. They've already given a classified report. If they're not on board, then they're sure acting very, very strange. All but right. surely the, the now, UNTF actually said that they were being obstructed and they weren't getting the information that they needed. I mean, okay, they, they replaced the guy who was uh, originally there um, yeah. weeks before they it was given the, the given the role. The new guy was given the role to investigate, and he didn't have yeah. the powers. But we're hearing that he was they were obstructed anyway. 
you know, by um, the Air Force, by the CIA. That's the things that I'm hearing. Uh, well, there's, there's rumors all over the place, but look, there's no question that there is opposition within the military intelligence complex to this issue. There's no question about that. Semi then made it quite clear. There were about 30 or 40 people inside the MIC, mostly in the DOD, that were backing them up. And in other words, this is the origin story. I'm trying to get this thing to go full screen. Let's see if it'll do that. Ah, good. Look, the origin story is not known. Every time Luis Elizondo is asked about it, he has to dodge the questions. He just can't go there. I, I've talked to a couple of people that interviewed him. I talked to one individual who interviewed him two years ago, uh, and he asked him a lot of questions about the origin story, and Lou would not answer him. And so he, he soured on him and says, you know, I just can't trust the guy. He didn't understand that Lou could not answer those. So they cannot talk about who the people are inside backing them up. They can't talk about how this all came about because that violates the cover and creates problems and they can't do it. This is, this is one of the onuses that they work under. They're doing the best they can. But yes, is there opposition? Yeah. But is that opposition winning? Hell, it was, look, let me tell you something. About four weeks ago, Three weeks ago, I, I got a call from Ashley Parker at the, at the Washington Post. Now, Ashley Parker is a really sharp journalist. I love her. But you know who Ashley Parker is? She's the White House bureau chief for the Washington Post. The White House bureau chief for the Washington Post. And she said, Steve, I'm going to write. She's going to write. She's not assigning it to one of her reporters. I'm going to write an article on these recent developments. What can you tell me? I spoke to her for 35 minutes and you know how I am, right? It's like, I mean, I, I know that she's looking for certain key lines, you know, related to it. I gave her 35 minutes of the bigger picture, but she listened and when she was done and she recorded the call, I said, I want you to record. She says, I'm recording this call. So she recorded the call about three days went and you can find this article. On, on my website, or you can search on the, the Washington Post. She writes a very solid article about the development. She's naming everybody, everybody. She's naming Brennan, who's the former CIA guy, director who would never say this 10 years ago, coming out saying, yeah, I don't think we understand this technology. And then you've got Woolsey, whose track record on this is very weird. He would never have said this. He comes out and she talks about, she's naming names and names and names and names and names. It's a fantastic article in the Washington Post by the White House bureau chief. And so I'm not in it, I'm not in it. I'm going, I get it, I get it. I, I tend to get into these larger pictures until the end of the article comes. And she finishes the article with a quote from me. And I'm paraphrasing the quote, I don't have it in front of me right now. But she says this, 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 and this, and according to Stephen Bass, who is an, a political activist and disclosure advocate, the government wants to get into the truth business. Why not start with a really big truth? She essentially acknowledged that what I was telling her about the process underway, which is to end this truth embargo and finally get the basic information, the fundamental information to the public, she's on it, she gets it. She knows that's where it's going. That's how I took that. Since then, I've been giving her a lot of information and a lot of stuff, and I'm hoping that we may do a major article in the Washington Post. This is not 1969 or 79 or 89. This isn't 2009. We are in a place we've never even been close to before. We are on the edge of finally ending this truth embargo. And the reason that I talk so strongly about this to people that I know to be highly intelligent and also engaging the issue and making documentaries like Ross look, and, and John, look, the reason I do is because all I do is follow this issue. I have no other life. I don't have a side job. I read every article. I watch the interviews. I'm, I'm getting stuff coming across my desk 24 and 7. I think I'm the most knowledgeable issue on the Oval R strategy and things going down in the world. I've got colleagues that, that know shitload more than me. I mean, Richard Dolan can go at length in a number of areas, but I'm sitting in an office in Washington, DC, two blocks from the Capitol, and I am doing nothing but focusing on everything that's going down. And so I'm telling you, I understand the big tick picture. 
I can go into details and other aspects. And I'm telling you guys, we're winning. This is happening. And I'll keep you informed. I've got some things coming up. I'm about to, well, some big things are happening on my end that are going to give me a little greater reach. But you just can't look at this doc or that individual statement or this podcast and go, this is what's going on. You got to watch 200 of them. You've got to watch, you've got to read hundreds of articles on this. And you start to go, ah, now I get it. That's my job. I'm doing the best I can. And I'm not, I'm not trying to offend anybody. I'm not trying to say I'm smarter than anybody else. I'm just saying that's all I got to do. No kids, no wife, no dogs, no cats, no <laughs> hobbies. I just sit there and I go through the media coverage of this. And I go through the statements and I go through the internet coverage and I sort the nonsense from the, from the good stuff. And I try to understand the strategy. And am I getting reinforcements on this? Yes. Am I, am I getting confirmation of this? Yes. And by the way, before we go on, has anybody seen the printout of the leak that Richard Dolan got? Have you seen it, Ross? Would you have a chance to see that? Yes, I've seen the printout. Yeah. I, I, okay. well, it's not, is it a printout or is it a, a synopsis of what somebody says they saw? Somebody inside verbally told one of Richard's very close confidants what he heard, what he was hearing in the briefing. He was in the briefing. So it's, a, it's a synopsis, then, not a printout. It's not, it's, not a, it's not an excerpt from the document. It is so not a direct excerpt. And then Richard wrote that down, or the person that gave it to him wrote it down. And Richard vetted it and said, look, I, I can't confirm it, but he put it out. And I think you saw that. Okay. How about John? Did you see it? Yeah, I did, yeah. Okay. And Dave? No, no, I missed that. Okay. I, I've been getting married. <laughs> okay. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to ask John and, and Ross their, their, their view of it, but let me just quickly summarize it for you, Dave. And again, I could pull it up right now if you want to take the time, but essentially what this person claims to have been told about what, among other things, went on in that briefing, and it's not a lot. What this leak says is this. These 70 members of four committees, and by the way, that's a lot of members, okay? When you, when you brief 70 members in Congress, you know it's going to leak. And so I assume from the beginning the, 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 o, the DOD knew for a fact that what they were going to give these members was going to get out. It's going to be leaked out. It's just a matter of time. And they, they wanted that. They actually wanted it leaked. Here's what they did. They briefed them on all of the key propulsion projects that the, the United States government is involved in. He listed them all. Uh, and I'll, it's like, I, again, if I bring them up, you know, there's, there's various kinds of nuclear versions and this and that. But these are all the most advanced propulsion systems that the government is working on. They briefed them on them. And one of them was anti-gravity. Interesting. They also mentioned they were briefed on uh, metamaterials, unusual materials, parentheses, ET related. Okay. So essentially, 70 members of Congress if it was a legitimate briefing, just got told, this is the latest stuff we got. That's interesting. Then after that, there was a couple of quick sentences. And in those sentences, they said this. They were told that all of these advanced technologies are tested at the Nellis range, which we sort of knew. That is where the testing is done. It's a vast complex. Most people have no idea how big it is. Okay, great. And that some, some sightings that people are having that they think are, quote, ET or whatever, these are, in fact, these, these propulsion systems, which means that they're not just studying them on paper. They're flying the damn thing. So if they weren't flying some of these systems, how could they be seen as a possible UFO? And then comes the punchline. We do not test these propulsion systems outside the Nellis range. And then finally, we, so, and the technology that is being seen in the clips and the reports that the ONI gave to Congress is not our technology. Now, how much more matter of fact can they be? So they said, look, remember the leak that they put out to the New York Times on June 3rd? Uh, we don't see ET stuff, but we don't have that tech. They just doubled down on it. They didn't just tell the, the members of Congress, we don't have that tech. They said, here's the tech we have. This is the systems that we're if doing. It's, if it's true, though, 
Stephen, if at the end of the day, um, Richard Dolan basically said that, okay, he, he believed, you know, that he was a good source. He trusts that source. He's had things off that source in the past, um, but he couldn't verify. So I'm still agree. going to take, you if know, going to caveat true. that. If it's not true, let's just put this aside. However, again, my, based upon the fact that all I do is assess this damn stuff, based upon everything else we know and what came out and a lot of other things, that is not that is not operating in a vacuum. That that reveal has a lot of supportive context. It makes a great deal of sense. If it doesn't get confirmed, let's talk again. I have confidence in it right now because it completely supports the strategy I'm seeing unfold. What they have done is they have gone on the record with members of Congress. This is where we are. All right. Now, what Congress chooses to do with that is up to Congress. And what the witnesses choose to say is up to the witnesses. But the DOD is clearly cooperating in a way that doesn't violate their mandate. The DOD does not have the, the, the mandate to tell this to the public. The only person that has the mandate to tell this to public is the United States president. Period. Not Rubio, not some witness. It is the, 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 the United States president. And so they, and they've always known that, which is why they went to such lengths to keep the stuff away from the president. By burying it down deep and taking the president out of the oversight role, they solved that problem. But we know that, that presidents have known about this. They have been briefed in some way about this. But and they could have forced it out anytime they wanted to. And I talk about this. I know exactly how the president could end the truth embargo tomorrow. Carter could have done it. Ford could have done it. They chose not to, not because they couldn't, but because the cost politically of doing it would have been profound. So they chose not to do it. That's obviously changing, which brings me to Biden. Again, Biden has been tipped off about this. He's been tipped off by Obama, who was tipped off by the Clintons, who were all over the Obama administration. So why? would he go out of his way to really stay out of it? Because that's the way it has to be. Biden needs to have this served up to him by the Congress in the congressional hearings, right? Why is that important? Because when those hearings take place and the witness testimony is seen by hundreds of millions of people over days, Obama, Obama, Biden has then the ability to come forward legitimately and say to the American people this, like you, I have been watching these hearings for these many days. The testimony is compelling. I've talked with key congressional leaders. I've talked with my people at the Pentagon, and we have all come to the consensus that this testimony does in fact confirm that part of this phenomena is non-human. It is extraterrestrial. You see the difference between that and the president finally deciding, I guess I got to tell the truth, calling a press conference and say, look, there's ETs here. I'm so sorry we didn't tell you sooner. Uh-uh. Right? So it is unfolding exactly how it should. Right? That's the strategy. So he's going to stay out of it. He's going to avoid answering questions. He wants the Congress to do its job. And you may say, no, no, he doesn't have anything. No, no, no. I'm sorry. I know too much about the Clintons, too much about when we're on the Obama administration, too much about a Podesta. I know what's going on, basically. I can't get down into the, the granular part of it. But believe me, the number of people running around Washington right now that know not only that ET presence is real, but the truth embargo is coming to an end is a large group of people. And the fact that there's a couple over on the side that don't know their ass from their elbow, they're saying, no, it can't happen. Forget about them. They're not important. What's important are the key players. And who are the key players? Pretty big shots, all right? Very big shots. And the number one guy out in front of the whole issue right now? Marco Rubio. Tucker Carlson is out in front of the issue as well. God bless Tucker, right? But he's just basically an outside guy trying to get some good press, right? And he loves getting some good press. I, I, like, I like the fact that he did it, but he's not important. Marco Rubio is extremely important. He's already on record. He's already committed. There's no way that he can back out of this. And so the only thing I'm waiting for is Mark Warner to make his move. And so what you can anticipate when things settle down to a point where we can do this properly, Warner and Rubio are going to make a joint 
statement that they're going to hold hearings and hopefully peg the date. You may say, well, wait a minute, Andrea Carson already asked for this. Is that so it's anticlimactic? No, it's not. Andre Carson was not supposed to do that. Believe me, way out ahead of his skis. He's a <laughs> subcommittee chair, but he did it, right? Because what the hell, right? But he, he, you know, I'm sure that Rubio went, Jesus Christ, Andre, please give me a break. He may not be the only one. Let me tell you something. At some point in the near future, you are going to have a situation, Ross, where members of committees in Congress are competing with each other to see who can get the furthest out in front of this issue. I want hearings. Oh, no, 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 no. I want hearings, too. Oh, well, I'm going to hold them this month. I'm holding them tomorrow. They're going to be competing to see who can get in front of this issue the most. Rubio's out in front right now. Ross made his move. Uh, rather, uh, uh, Andre made his move. It's not going to go anywhere. There's no chance the first hearings are going to be under a subcommittee. It'll be probably the Intel Committee. That's where things are at, man. Listen, um, guys, let's let's wrap this up because I'm conscious it's very, very late in the morning for Ross and he could yeah. do getting back to bed. And no, I'm so grateful. I can see the sun course. coming up there, Ross. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going on and on. It's four in the morning in Australia. I owe you, guy. I owe you big time. Anytime you want a, a, an interview with me, you call me. I'll do it at two in the morning. I don't care what that is. Yeah. <laughs> and you know, Steve, what I love about you is I know you would. <laughs> God, yes. Right? A, there isn't a microphone I have ever seen that I would not get in front of. I'm a total whore when it comes to giving interviews. Uh, just, I, I just want to make one final comment where I do agree with Steve, is that if that Richard Dolan document is an accurate representation of what has been said in the classified version of the UAP report, the thing that I found most exciting was the, the line, I think they said something like, um, advanced use of exotic uh, elements for, for energy research. And in, in brackets, there was something like... Um, ET, 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 ET related. It said ET, ET related <laughs> items. Right. Uh, and that, if, if that is indeed an accurate representation of the classified version of the report, that is very exciting. Uh, because it does mean that, that, you know, there is an open candor talking about ET-related items in the classified version of the report. Um, I just um, I just hope that that's the case, because I've, one thing that surprises me is that the, uh, the classified version of the report hasn't leaked yet. You, you would yeah. think that it would. I think one of the reasons it hasn't is that... Uh, well, uh, first of all, you have, the, you have the two Senate committees, all right? Uh, you got the Intel and the Armed Services, and these are the most important committees. And you know the whole situation on these bills that are going through Congress right now, they all depend upon the Senate situation, the 50-50, okay? So like every single senator in, 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 is, is, is a big deal, right? If the Senate was like 60-40, it would be different. And so every one of those senators is under a huge pressure. How are you going to vote? on these bills. And so anything that kind of muddies the water there, that's not good. And so it's really an unusual situation. And so the idea of uh, going any further with respect to this, this other major historical thing, it's easy. So let, let's, let's get this resolved first. Okay. Every, every look, Marco Rubio, he's a key Senator. Okay. He is, he is probably going to have to vote against the damn civil rights thing. Right. That's brutal. Right. And so he, 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 he's, he's under enormous pressure on that. Uh, and there are and all the other senators on those two enormous pressure. What are you going to do about these two bills? And so if anything, after they've gone, th gotten through that, after we've actually gotten that done, the filibuster is done away with and everybody's yelled and screamed at each other, but the law is made. I can tell you right now, if I'm a senator on any of those committees, I so want those hearings so bad. I want those hearings because one, the American public is going to immediately forget all that other shit and go right over and say, oh boy, I want to know more. Tell me about this ET stuff. And, and, and it's nonpartisan and it's going to be exciting and it's positive and they're going to be going, oh, thank God. Because by and large, being a member of the Senate for the last four years, particularly the last two years, it's got to be hell. Absolutely hell. And not particularly good for the members of Congress. And so you Believe me, down deep secretly, they're going, oh, please, God, give me something profound that excites people and is positive and it's not political and I can be on TV <laughs> doing good stuff. That's a good way that, to end it. That's a good that's way to end it. That's what I know about those guys. Let's end it, let's end it for there. Excellent. All right.
Uh, guys, I really can't thank you enough. You've been so generous with your time and information. It's very uh, humbling. I'm so grateful. Thank you. Yeah, Thanks, thank Dave. You so much, I, I, I appreciate it. I love having friends in the UK because one day I'm going to have to have to be forced to live there. So <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> come to Wales. We'll, well, Australia we'll too. Right I may have to come to Australia. Either one. I need friends out of the country because you know things could go really sour. Yeah. Come on down, mate. Come on down. <laughs> Thank you, okay. guys. Uh, yeah, enjoy the rest of your days and nights. I'll talk to you later. This has been one of my favorites ever. I just want to say. Oh yeah. Before we go. Thanks, Thank you, Thank you guys. Goodbye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye.